What does it take to build education technologies that serve everyone involved? I got really interested in how do you build strong educational technologies? What constitutes a quality product? Dr. Anissa Moeni, founder and CEO of Gold Star Education, is leading the charge to ensure edtech companies don't just build products, but create lasting impact. True entrepreneurship is being of service to, the, to your community and to the people around you. To start, I asked her about a quote that has shaped her journey. If you see a need in the world and no one else is addressing it, it's your responsibility to do something about it. What does this quote mean to you? This is the quote that my father used to always tell me about entrepreneurship. And he always said that's true entrepreneurship is being of service to the to your community and to the people around you. And so if you're able to, if you see something that people truly need and you're able to meet that need and also create a sustainable way to continue to meet that need, then that's entrepreneurship. And so that's something that's been top of mind for, for me and my family um, as we started to do different projects. Is there a way that he did that? Yeah, my dad always approached his own ventures in that way. His very first business in Iran um, was actually selling appliances door to door. And um, he noticed that when he was selling the vacuums, there, there was vacuum bags that the vacuums needed um, to work with. And those bags were something that once they ran out, they had to be imported and they were very expensive. And so um, a way to serve his community then was to actually make those vacuum bags less expensive. And so he um, started a business where he would actually uh, produce those vacuum bags within Iran. And at the same time, he noticed that uh, cardboard boxes were imported in Iran. And so that was another thing that he started to do and to bring the price of cardboard boxes down. So that was his first foray into noticing what his community needed and serving that and, um, and making people's lives easier and better. Um, and, uh, and his business was actually taken away during the revolution. So he was uh, in Germany on a business trip and uh, and all of his assets were seized, and this was right after the revolution, and um, he ended up staying in, in Germany. And, um, and he actually was um, able to start another business there, which was a hotel, um, and which serviced a lot of the immigrants that came through at the time and refugees. And one of the things that he was really interested in then was this concept of connecting people back home because he so dramatically was unable to go home and he had so many people that would come through um, in Germany that had the same situation. And um, at the time he started exploring this, this concept of um, being able to call and making it as inexpensive as possible to call back home from his hotel. And then when he moved to Canada years later, it was right when the telecom industry was deregulating. And so we had monopolies at the time that were setting prices for how much it costs to call long distance. And when it deregulated, that meant that the price of, the, of long distance calling could be any rate that the companies could actually afford. And so he looked into it and thought, how much does it really cost to call um, Iran, to call Israel, to call India, to call, because actually Toronto, where he had moved with my mom, um, was actually over half the population of Toronto was born outside of Canada at the time. And it was um, one of the most multicultural cities in the world. And so there was a lot of people that had relatives um, back home in different places. And, um, and that wanted to call home. So that was a major need, was this connecting back home and something that he and my mother felt a lot, very deeply, um, as, many, as many did around them in their communities. And so they were able to see that. And um, when the telecom industry is deregulated, they got into that business, saw how much it actually cost, which was about 10% of the actual cost that was being charged at the time. And 
they designed products for um, immigrants and newcomers like themselves. And so it was prepaid long distance calling cards. It was customer service in multiple languages at the time uh, because they themselves remembered what it was like to have to learn um, a new language coming to a country. Um, and it was, uh, and the customer service was very much at the heart of the business where um, there was constant feedback and, um, and if there was ever a problem with any of the lines, customers would tell them first. It was a great, um, that's how the, the telecom business started. And from there, um, it was really some, a product that was very loved by, uh, by people across Canada because it was a way that they were connecting back home. And um, so that's, that was that, how the telecom industry started. And then from there, um, obviously things went IP, so it became voice over IP, and then um, they started an IPTV business, which was um, another level of connecting people back home to their cultures, where we would um, get content from different countries, the rights outside of that country globally. And so if you had left, for example, China and you missed home and you wanted to connect back, we would get the rights for Chinese content globally um, outside the country and you could stream that content and that product was called GL Wiz and it was and it exists today it started with um, Persian content so we actually um, had content from outside and inside of Iran interestingly um, so that people can connect back home um, and start with Persian we had um, or have Arabic Turkish Afghani Kurdish so the Middle Eastern, um, and then had a Portuguese package, Chinese. And so it was really an extension of the connection back home um, with being able to call your loved ones. And this was being able to connect to your culture and to the media and content from back home. So those are, those are the uh, businesses that uh, my dad created. And actually, the, the telco business was together with my mom. So that was, that was fun. I actually have experience with this because I didn't realize it was this company that's responsible for my grandmother being able to watch Persian TV. But <laughs> yeah, I've had to do some uh, technical difficulty fixing up with that. And oh, that's funny. <laughs> it works. <laughs> it works. Yeah. So yeah. were you involved at this point with, with this intercontinental television? I was. So when, the, at the time that I joined... Um, that was when we were starting to get the rights for other other countries' um, content. And so I started with um, the Arabic and um, content and Turkish and um, Chinese, Portuguese. So that was uh, the time that I joined the family business. So what is the, how did you go from this to an education so I always loved education. And for me, my grandma was, I was very lucky that when my mom was pregnant with me, my grandma actually escaped from Iran and she was a school teacher for 25 years. And she was given a really tough ultimatum of um, converting to Islam or giving back the, the money that she had been given, paid for those 25 years that she was a teacher. And so, she felt she had no choice. She escaped on a camel to Pakistan with my 12 year old cousin. And at the time my mom was pregnant with me, they were living in Germany. Um, and my mom um, went and collected my grandma from Pakistan and she raised me as well. And so um, my grandma was a school teacher and my whole life I watched her every Saturday morning go and teach um, Persian classes to all the kids. Uh, we moved to Canada when I was three. And so from since I can remember, she would be everyone's ki kindergarten teacher at Persian school. And she was really passionate about education. And for me, I grew up with this understanding that of not taking my education for granted, that if I was still in Iran, I wouldn't have the opportunities with um, education that I did outside. And I really appreciated that. And being a Baha'i, the principle of universal education is really top of mind for me. And so hearing the stories of how people don't, 
you know, have access to high quality in a world where we have so much technology around us and resources um, in some places and others not. And so it was really um, something that was always top of mind. And um, I actually did my master's. I went to business school for my undergrad, but I did my master's um, in international education development with a specialization in technologies, instructional technology and design. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that I joined the family business and build the ed tech department. And what happened was um, I started to work with the media team and, and building out um, TV product. And what was really good about that experience was that I saw that educational technologies are not the same um, as media and telecom because they're actually more similar to medical products um, where you have a customer that is not... Um, doesn't understand their own learning process the way you don't understand your own healing process. So you need a product to be built with um, evidence and to um, have enough research behind it to explain how to use it with fidelity of how often do you need to use this. Just like when you're taking um, medicine, you need to know how often do you, what are the side effects you don't understand your whole own healing process. And so a hundred years ago, the pharma industry was not regulated. And so we had these snake oil salesmen that would make claims um, about products that we had no idea. And today, educational technologies are not regulated. The problem is that we can't do what they did in medicine and, and do randomized control trials because educational technologies are not stable. So you have um, drugs, you run a trial on a drug or a vaccine, and that product is stable. You're not going to change it at all. If somebody were to say, okay, well, the vaccine passed, but we've changed it a little bit since that trial, it, we would be mortified. We'd say, go back and do a trial again. But in, in, um, for educational technologies, we're constantly iterating because in tech, we're constantly iterating and we want to because we have very different contexts that products are used. There's, we need to translate it for different schools, different communities. Um, we need to have processes where we're constantly listening and, and iterating the tech for different situations. And so we can't run trials on them because you're never getting the version of the product that the trial was, um, that we did the trial on. And it's not, it doesn't actually even make sense in a tech um, context to run trials because it takes a couple of years, the products are constantly changing. And so what we, um, my research actually, I got really interested in how do you build strong educational technologies? What constitutes a quality product? You know, a lot of people have experience with a Duolingo, for example. And this is a, you know, when you use these products to le learn languages, and I say, hey, Bashir, you, you, you got Duolingo, you wanted to learn Spanish before going to Argentina next year. And then it's the next year, I say, Bashir, did you learn? How, did you use Duolingo? And a rational person would say, you know, I didn't learn, but it's because I, I'm not so good at languages. You know, you don't know yourself that the product's not built with evidence, with integrity, or that they haven't done enough research to understand what in your context and your learning abilities, what's the optimal thing to serve you in that app? What's the amount of time that you should be doing that? And so there's a lot of evidence that needs to go into it. And you as the user are quite vulnerable. We're at this, there is a lot of information asymmetry and vulnerability in educational technologies where we're expecting it to be built with some integrity, but it's not regulated and actually, um, there isn't that much guidance for the developers of those technologies and companies of how to build it with quality, what constitutes sufficient evidence. And so while I was in the family business and building products in media and telecom, I became really aware of that. I thought, even if we have a customer service, the customers can't tell me if the product is working or not. You know, um, They can say whether or not they're enjoying using the app, if they've learned and they give you some data points, but they can't tell you everything because your learning process is something that um, there's a lot of research that needs to be put into it as well. And so that's how I, um, I started looking for who could teach me this. And I and, uh, spoke to different universities and they basically, the consensus was there's nothing out there that can teach us. We don't know actually what constitutes a sufficient evidence because this is not something that 
has been studied in this way. And so we can't guide companies. We can say what constitutes evidence at a certain moment in time, but continuously um, there was no knowledge of that. And so essentially what I ended up doing was I, um, I got really lucky and there was this professor, Rose Luckin, who was sort of the mother of AI and education. She had been in AI and education for many years as a researcher at University College London and at the Institute of Education there. And she had been working on getting funding to help companies um, and a research accelerator to help companies to learn how academics and researchers would approach proving their products work and to help them to build research capacity within small to medium enterprises where smaller to medium companies are, you know, generally have less access to research. Um, uh, researchers, they have less of a budget for these things. And so the idea was that to build this capacity within businesses. And I happened to hear her say this in a podcast. And so I reached out to her um, and wrote a proposal for what I wanted to do at, for to helping entrepreneurs to, to build these products moving forward. I wanted to look at what constitutes sufficient evidence, what's a good quality ed tech product. And she accepted me because of my background in, as an entrepreneur, not um, because of my education or research background, because I had none. Um, I had done a master's in education, but not a research uh, degree. And so it was fun because I was able to work with, in the end, 276 ed tech companies that came through in two and a half years to the university. And we had, um, 15 to 20 researchers that were working with them during that time. And I was able to, to have a, I had a great time looking at all these companies and seeing what is it that the ones that were able to deliver on their promise and to build these products that were actually of service to their customers, what is it that they were doing that was different? And what I found was, um, and the result of my doctorate was this model, um, that is called, I call it the six superpowers of ed tech companies now. But the most important thing, the goal and like the heart of the model is that companies have a learning culture, which is actually a full, it was a full circle moment for me because essentially it's what the Universal House of Justice asks us to do um, is to have this continuous posture of action, reflection, consultation and all that we do because we're serving people and beneficiaries in very different contexts and different communities with different needs. And so when companies are building products, if they're expecting to continuously build with um, this posture of action, reflection, consultation within the enterprise throughout the life of that product, then it's much more likely to be of service. And so what um, I built from the doctorate was a diagnostic tool and my started a company called gold star education and the diagnostic tool actually measures the extent to which companies are building with cycles of action reflection. So we, we call it a learning culture and, um, products are basically in a company that looks a little more like the data that's being collected, where it's flowing. Is it going to the right teams? Are they able to, what are the processes for reflecting on that within each team? And then how does that flow back and what do the cycles look like? And so that's the most important of the six, uh, that's the goal of all of the, the six superpowers is to establish this learning culture. Now, the six superpowers actually are not equally weighted. Um, they have dependencies, there's a foundational one, and then they all actually sit on top of each other. And so the basis and the foundation for all six is a leadership vision. And that leadership is actually mindset where the other ones are um, about knowledge and assets and processes within the enterprise. Leadership vision is about an understanding and mindset of the leadership of the enterprise. And really at the heart of the leadership vision is for leaders to want to be of service and they're building products that they're truly curious about whether or not every iteration, every change is continuing to be of service anywhere, any new place that the product is delivered to or scaled, that the product is continuing to be of service. And, and they have that posture of curiosity and 
a service orientation throughout for their entire the enterprise. And so, and their goal is to then establish this learning culture, um, so which is the next superpower that is, you know, the, the, the goal of any um, a tech company within this model, but it sits on a leadership's um, intention to be of service. And so we measure these things now, which is really as a full circle moment from coming from, you know, this idea that was shared with me when I was a child <laughs> and since then about entrepreneurship as service and, and you know, as a Baha'i, um, these cycles of, uh, that, of continuous action reflection, consultation, consolidation, and seeing that actually the data from my thesis showed that that's what's most important for companies too. So um, this research in EdTech is actually being applied now um, to other industries. We're starting uh, work in uh, med tech as well because uh, the a, a lot of the software and um, applications are not regulated as well. And so, uh, applying it to other service and purpose-driven industries and so and purpose-driven technologies. So making sure that that purpose is being fulfilled. And so that's, um, that's my journey and how, you know, it all kind of flowed one to another. You brought up uh, Duolingo earlier and these some over 200 companies. Yeah. Are the products they're working on mainly uh, towards or to be used in academic institutions, like grade school, universities, or at the individual level, like Duolingo, mix of the two? So products, educational technologies, when I, um, it doesn't really, it doesn't matter to me and my research um, and our diagnostics when we do, when we run the diagnostics to, to see um, how the companies are doing with their superpowers, it doesn't matter what part of education the product is being built for. It could be for individuals like Duolingo. It can be for within a, a school context. It could be university context. Um, so it doesn't, as long as it's a, it's a learning technology, something that the, is, is claiming to have a learning outcome. And um, we look to see if that outcome is uh, likely to be fulfilled, and the evidence of that happening. Let's say a company comes to Gold Star and says, hey, I've uh, got this technology, uses uh, active recall, space repetition to help uh, students learn, but we don't know if, we don't really know what we're doing and we want to get better. So what would that process look like of improving? So um, there's one of two things that we do with companies. That's my favorite is to work directly with companies and and and, um, and help to develop an impact strategy. So we do, uh, we run a diagnostic if they want to be precise to see where they're at with the six, with their six superpowers. And, um, and basically we do it per product. So if a company has multiple products, then we would run the diagnostic on multiple products to see the evidence behind that product and the team behind it and, um, and how, how they're building it. So basically, and we'll tell them that within these six elements, you are, um, this is your score for each one of the six superpowers and this is your score overall. And, um, and basically we'll help them with, you know, these are the different elements that you need to, to work on because the six superpowers are weighted and they're on top of you, like they are basically, they have dependencies. We start with the foundational ones. And so, um, if the foundations are often we'll, we'll help them to de develop those elements first. Um, another thing that we do, if the companies don't necessarily need to have an exact score and run the diagnostic is to actually just, um, help them by doing workshops. So we'll do impact workshops and strategic research workshops where we help companies to start to, and their leadership teams to come together, to consult. To, and we draw out what the purpose of the product is, how they want to be of service, what are, what's the data that they need to collect to continuously monitor that, uh, what's their North Star, and we start to we draw out all that information and help them with a strategy for the kind of research they need to do continuously, what can be automated within their tool, um, what processes that they need to build out within the business for that to, con 
for that action reflection consultation to continue um, throughout the life of that product. And so we'll do a half day or a full day workshop and just get the companies organized. And so that's a really, that's one um, thing that we'll do that has been really impactful. And it's just about building um, that strategy around fulfilling your purpose. Um, so it's actually, you'd say more important at the company level, their process, their values, than whatever it is they're doing. The product itself. It's really important. So this is the, this is the thing that's the outcome of my, my research that was a little bit it's a little bit strange for many is that when you're purchasing ed tech, it's like you're purchasing a product. It's not, that's not done. It's like you're purchasing a painting that isn't finished. And so if you were to purchase a painting that isn't finished, you'd look at the painter to see that they have, what's their style, what's their abilities, their capacities. Do they have a process? You know, is it going to be likely to be finished? So you look at all of those things to make sure that you can trust that this painting is going to come to fruition in the way that you want. So right now, EdTech, people are underestimating that it's not done. The product is continuously being changed in different contexts and we want it to be changed. And so we must look at the developers of that product. And so our diagnostic is actually a survey that we send to the entire leadership team. And depending on the size of the business, we'll send it to some um, other team members as well. And it's a strong proxy. Their answers to it populates our model and tells us the six, how they're doing on the six superpowers for that product. And so we must look at the painter that hasn't finished the painting before we purchase it. But the problem is that right now there is an underestimation of how, you know, about like this, they, um, of how important it is to look at the teams. And also because no one has done a study like mine, they were, I was very lucky to have the chance to look at hundreds of businesses within a research accelerator. So we were able to see under the hood of many businesses and see what they're actually doing to prove their products work, how that research fits into their normal business practice. And so I was able to see that those companies that were delivering had certain qualities, um, had certain processes, assets, mindsets. And so that turned into the six superpower model. So. The, really the battle right now, most of it, Bashir is even explaining that if you're going to buy a product, you have to look at the team behind it because they're going to change the product all the time. And so um, that's what the diagnostic does. It gives insight into the partners that you're starting to work with, essentially, when you buy an ed tech product, especially if you're a school, you know, um, a state, district, country, where a lot of times products are purchased for um, many, you know, for larger regions. And so it's really important to know whether or not this company is going to, is set up to be of service. And if not, then how we can, um, quickly get that set up going. And so that's my favorite part of the business is actually helping companies to, um, to be more impactful, um, and to, to be more of service because a lot of times ed tech founders don't go into it for the money. It's not an easy, industry to make money in. And so a lot of times this is an industry where you have founders that are very much purpose driven and they really do want to be of service, but there's a, because of a lack of experience with research, there's an underestimation of how much you have to continuously have these cycles of reflection. Just, you know, as Baha'is we're used to that. And it's because the house of justice has told us this for years. And so we, and we've experienced it for years and we see that how important it is in various contexts, but it's not something that's intuitive um, for companies necessarily that, and for founders and leadership that don't have experience with research as much, that it's not, research is never done for a dynamic product that's being served to humans um, that are in very different contexts. Do you think it happens or this mindset kind of occurs naturally in more business entrepreneurship uh, context where you have to iterate? So I think that it it's, there's a move in business, you know, VCs and the entire model of a lot of investors is to prove a product works and then to scale it and to hopefully have a unicorn. And so that is, um, 
actually really tough in education and a lot of um, products that are built for um, humans that are in different contexts. And so um, social science research methods like are more sensitive to uh, humans in various contexts. And um, it's something that actually our entire industry is not built for necessarily, that the way that investors even approach it and their business models for VCs are not built for serving um, companies that are going to continuously have the ear on the ground and continuously iterate and maybe have many versions of products. And I'm not saying that it's not something that is doable and feasible and can be profitable, but it's not that easy. It's actually really, really tough in education and um, and it's, it's continuous. It, there needs to be this continuous um, uh, reflection and, um, and this is not something that founders are necessarily doing. I have met, I, I'm writing a book at the moment that is, um, a handbook for, ed, for leadership of purpose driven, um, uh, educational technology companies and also founders specifically of like the purpose driven founders. And it's not just for education, but also for tech in general, because they, as if the tech is for humans in different contexts, well, we always have to pay attention and make sure that the products are of service as we scale. Um, and there's they're going to be, you know, a, um, explanation of each one of the six superpowers and also vignettes of, and stories of different founders and what they did, um, within each of those six. And so I think that that would be, um, nice and, and a helpful way of illustrating like what actually is happening instead of me explaining it in such an abstract way. It's like actually, for example, one of the founders um, that I will be profiling in the leadership vision, his name is Jason Green, and he talked about how he went to Morehouse College in Atlanta where um, Martin Luther King attended that university. It's a very prestigious university that's all about being service oriented. And he said from the beginning of, you know, the edu their education, there was this idea of how can you be of service for your entire career and all that you do. And so that mentality was really, I could see that in the way that he built his product because leadership needs to be in, in love with the problem of solving that problem. If they're in love with their solution, then that is, you, that's a red flag. So Jason, for example, changed his solution so many times and continuously iterated it. And it, it has, is looks so different from how it started because he was constantly on the ground seeing if the product is of service because that's in his DNA. It's his mindset. That's his foundation as uh, his leadership vision. Superpower is really strong. So that it's really important to, um, to have that kind of mentality. And that's really what everything rests on is to have that service orientation. Um, what is that product and how was uh, he receiving feedback on it? So his product was all, he was really interested in how classrooms are not um, necessarily serving all students. He himself struggled in school. And while he was in university um, in Atlanta, he would, volunteer and go and teach at schools as well. And, um, and he was really interested in how there was so many students that were literally around the corner from one of the most prestigious universities in the country that were in high school and still couldn't read. And he was seeing that these um, classrooms are not of service to all students. There's very different contexts. He himself struggled with different, you know, with classrooms and had to do a lot of his studying on his own in different ways because the way that classrooms were set up were not of service. And so what he did was that he did a lot of research talking to different, um, to looking at different classrooms about learning. And then he realized that there's, what he can do is empower teachers to cater to students in different ways. And so what he started out with was um, training courses for teachers which then became an ed tech product for teachers to train them in, in different ways of catering to students and building their classroom, which now has become an AI tool that's quite innovative that also um, 
delivers content to teachers um, in different ways to, to allow for students to learn. And so his research actually ended up being um, on how to adult learning because he's teaching the teachers that are the adults on how to then um, serve students uh, in different ways that are, have varying needs in classrooms. And so um, it's really wonderful to see because the product has evolved a lot and it's changed. And at the beginning, right after school, he was actually a motivational speaker. And so that's another, you know, to be able to go into the classrooms speak to them about his experience and also he was collecting a lot of feedback um, and about experiences of students and and so that was you know this continuous research and he has partnerships with stanford where he keeps you know doing that uh, research around adult learning and um, he's they published a lot and so there's this you know that's the basis of it is having a leadership that's service oriented that's curious that's continuously collecting data and reflecting and that is in love with solving the problem and not in love with their solution. So that's really the, the heart of it. Are there other companies or founders that stand out to you for doing this well? So, you know, honestly, there's, there's so many, I wouldn't say that any one founder, I'm not, I'm, you know, we were talking about leadership vision as a foundational one, and Jason's a wonderful example of that. Until we run our diagnostic, I can't say who's done everything well. And also the, the reason that we call it Gold Star Diagnostics is because it's like going to the doctor. At that moment in time, you are the doctor, you get a, you know, your blood work and you get a checkup and, and you might have certain things that are off this year, or you might actually be wonderful and then, but you, you know, stop exercising and um, you stop taking care of yourself and you go back next year and things change. And so a business is really similar to that where they need to get checkups um, with the diagnostic. And so their processes, mindsets, assets, all of these things that we're looking at, we're taking stock of what's happening in the enterprise. And those things might change, leadership might change, priorities might change, things might come in, um, and erode some of those processes. And so um, it's still the leadership, as long as leadership's there and the mindsets are there, it's quite, the foundation should be quite stable. But um, the six superpowers is something that we have to run the diagnostic on. And as Gold Star, we never say what people's score is because that's like medical information. We treat it uh, in that way that, you know, you come in and you, um, experience, you know, you get your diagnostic. We don't say that you've even done that um, because that's something that's really in, like for the company to have that information and to then be able to, um, to learn how to improve. So when I give the example of Jason for Leadership Vision, I'm gonna have examples um, in, in my book about purpose-driven um, tech founders in all different, in, in each of the six superpowers. And so, um, there will have examples in learning culture and, and the others. So the other superpowers of sense of purpose, um, teamwork and research know-how and action orientation. So those are all the superpowers. Each one will have examples within them, but I would never give one that's perfect for everything because companies are always changing and it's just, um, not something that we would share, but companies can share it themselves of how they did that year. <laughs> How can either individual consumers or institutions who want to work with edtech companies, uh, how do they verify that they're doing a good job on these? Yeah, so that's actually one of the projects that we have um, right now in, in the U.S. And the reason that I moved from, um, from the U.K. over to D.C. now, where I'm based, is um, because we... Um, want to implement this into the procurement process of U.S. school districts. And so um, what happens is that school districts will be looking at various products. And so um, and they might be looking at, to try to choose between various products for a certain um, purpose. And so we can run the diet. We invite the companies um, to answer the diagnostic and then we'll compare those um, the results and let school districts know uh, what elements um, they may 
shine in and what elements they may fall short in and school districts can then make a more informed decision and another thing that is good about it is that it's empowering for school districts to just know you know what they can even add to their contracts with those companies that we would love to work with you um, but we you know we want to see that you do xyz or develop these capacities over the course of the year or however long the contract is and so it gives um, the ability for districts to know what they're purchasing and even if it's not perfect to um, even have that kind of understanding and agreement that companies start to develop those capacities and to work on those things to be more of service to them. And companies also are able to focus their R&D on something that's going to result in a sale and also result in um, a, a, you know, delivering to a certain context and so they can focus on the evidence that's needed for that context. And so um, the idea, that's the idea with one of the applications of um, the diagnostic for purchasers is really to have that insight into what's happening um, from the get go and, and, and get to know, get to know their, uh, the companies that they're going to partner with essentially. So I'm fascinated with this idea of how actually improving the virtues in a business or in an organization can lead to profit so that the incentives are completely aligned. And uh, there's uh, Darren Dodson does a lot of work with this. He uh, works in the venture capital space. And one thing that he's found is that uh, black and minority leaders are consistently underinvested in. And as a result of that, uh, they, they're not given the opportunities that they necessarily uh, should have considering their capabilities. But then what that also means is that there's a, uh, a big opportunity there for those people and for the people who recognize that, uh, that well, it's underserved capacity that can then be used. So actually the ethical thing for uh, going down the path of uh, equality is also in many cases profitable. Yeah, it's true. And I mean, it's profitable. I think if um, the purchaser understands that this company has been doing this work and is going to be of service to them. So I speak to school districts that it's a pain point for them, you know, when they when they start to work with the company and they say, okay, th these elements aren't working, or, you know, and then the company doesn't pivot um, and doesn't um, is not able to, to to even they don't have the processes to collect that data and to then change the product. They're not expecting to. They don't have those mindsets, and so it's really um, they're not set up to listen to them in that way. And so it's profitable. Um, if the you know in if the companies are asked to be set up like that, so that then you know they'll sell into districts, and so it's worth it for them to do that. And then they you know then there's this understanding that this is you know what the demand side needs, and so they'll start to to supply that. So the idea with a dis district project is to to align these incentives. But otherwise, if there's a blind spot for the purchasers, they have no idea. We're just looking at the product. A lot of times um, the product has some evidence that it works, but it's from years ago um, or it's a study that's on, built on some some part of the product, but it's not the product that you're getting. The, there's no research about your context. That's not clear. You know, you just see that, oh, there's been a study on this product and um, and so it's it's really tough for purchasers to understand whether or not this is going to be of service. And um, a lot of times, companies will just uh, overclaim the capacity, uh, the the um, the results that this product is going to likely to have, um, because of sometimes it's because they don't have the fifth superpower, which is research know how. So they'll have results from a study and they're underestimating what that means in other contexts, you know? And so that's one of the, the, the problems with um, not having that, like those abilities within the business and also having a blind spot on the purchaser's side. So we're, we're basically trying to, to re, you know, relieve purchasers by giving them 
this insight into their partner and then helping companies to align and to sell. And so um, encouraging them to do that. So for us, it's, you know, Gold Star the, is all about, um, my goal is to raise the standard of ed tech so that it's more of service to learners um, and to help with education equity as well. And what you mentioned that um, there's a lot of, there's an underinvestment in, um, in black founders in America. And that's something that we found in, in ed tech as well, unsurprisingly. And so that's why a lot of ed tech um, is not be of service to um, black and brown students because products are being, are there's an underinvestment in those founders, founders that understand the context of black and brown students. And so if there isn't this um, mindset and understanding of being of service and continuously collecting this data, then products are not gonna be of service to different contexts at all. And so that's part of the reason that we're encouraging this is to start to move the needle on being of service to, to various contexts. Um, what makes you excited about the future of education? Um, I, what makes me excited about the future? I mean, I believe it's inevitable that these technologies are going to become stronger and more empowering. Um, and I'm really excited for a time where everyone has access to high quality education. Um, and I don't believe that the technologies are going to be mostly screens. It's going to be a lot of access to empowering teachers, empowering students, giving a lot of data, observing students, how they're feeling, allowing them to work together more, developing their virtues, their capacities to serve. I think it's really exciting what this tech can do, um, we'll be able to do and to capture this nuance of our human side, because as we see that AI is going to replace a lot of the things that we do that are quite mechanical and quite repetitive. It'll do it better than us. And so the things that humans need to do and learn is how to be more, we're gonna become more and more human, more creative, more collaborative. We're gonna spend a lot more time being of service to our communities and, and working together. And I believe that the future of education, we're gonna see really quickly, we can't continue the way that we are. Um, and it's gonna change and be a lot more more fun, more interesting, more human. Um, and we'll, I think um, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a lot of fun in the future. And so we're just at the beginning with EdTech right now. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of interesting innovations to come. Uh, right now, the, the products that are doing well are those that are, um, are serving the way that the, the system is currently because the really innovative stuff's not gonna fit in and not gonna sell in the same way. But I think that um, as we start to, to develop more and as you know um, jobs start to change and things start to get automated more, we're gonna get braver about our education as well. And so I think it'll be really interesting times. What role do you think technology can play, if any, in teaching morals? Um, well, <laughs> there's a lot. I don't believe that we're going to have a time where there's no teachers. So we're still going to have a lot of that empowerment of teachers to help with the, the teaching of uh, morals. I think that um, it's more about, I mean, there's a lot that technology can do. There's simulations. It could, you can develop empathy by being put into situations that you wouldn't otherwise be put into. So there's a... Um, really a uh, nice company in um, out of Stanford um, that was built by one of the researchers of the School of Education and the, actually their tennis coach. She was a really famous tennis coach for their um, tennis team uh, that turned it around and did really well with their team. And um, they actually use um, uh, VR headsets to put uh, sports teams like players into different situations and to, um, to 
make them understand and to, you know, experience situations. And so they'll do really high quality experiences where, you know, you're a football player and you're running onto the field, you see the crowd and it's from that perspective, it's huge. And there's that energy and you're in a huddle and all of these things. And then, you know, so you get this and then something happens and how do you deal with that moral dilemma? And so it has this ability to transform you to a place and to like move your heart in a way that is an, another level, for example, today. Those are the things that are available, um, but there's gonna be, so these kinds of simulations and things are able to um, trigger your limbic system to make you um, feel. So it's like, it, it, you know, so, um, and which is really, really helpful to put you into situations um, that just talking about um, or reading, I mean, sometimes reading about is, is also still, it's like a uh, really powerful, so, but, you know, there are possibilities with technology to immerse you in a way that doesn't um, more than before. Um, but there's just, you know, or take you to places that you haven't been. Um, but it's just the beginning. So there's going to be a lot, a lot around that. And um, it depends on the, the, you know, the policies around what morals and in what approach and all of that. And um, to design those technologies. And so that really comes down to the, the policymakers and the approach of the school, but there's a lot of cool things that can be done. I think that's a great place to call it here. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. What does it take to build education technologies that serve everyone involved? I got really interested in how do you build strong educational technologies? What constitutes a quality product? Dr. Anissa Moini, founder and CEO of Gold Star Education, is leading the charge to ensure edtech companies don't just build products, but create lasting impact. True entrepreneurship is being of service to, the, to your community and to the people around you. To start, I asked her about a quote that has shaped her journey. 